Discretion is advised. This is Ten Minute Murder. On the 6th of November, 1955, Alton Coleman was born in Illinois. Because his mother was working three different jobs to support herself, Alton grew up in the care of his grandmother. From an early age, he was antisocial, and he did not get along with others. And those traits only got worse as he grew older. When Alton was 18 years old, he was charged with his first sex crime. Over the next decade, he was charged with a total of five more similar crimes. He pled guilty to two of them, was acquitted of two more, and the final two were dismissed. One of the two cases that was scheduled to go to court was the sexual assault of a 14-year-old girl. But before the 1984 trial began, Alton decided to go on the run. But Alton did not flee from the law all by himself. Deborah Brown a woman with an intellectual disability, came with him. Deborah and Alton had met the previous year when she was engaged to a different man, but she quickly decided to leave her fiancé and move in with Alton. As well as her intellectual disability, Deborah suffered from dependent personality disorder, giving her an irresistible urge to be looked after by other people. She relied on Alton and was willing to do anything he asked no matter the consequences. So when Alton told Deborah that he was going on the run, she did not hesitate to come with him. Unlike Alton, Deborah didn't have any criminal charges. In fact, she had never been in trouble with the law ever. But when Alton started abducting, assaulting, and murdering young children, Deborah didn't just stand back and watch. In fact, she was a willing accomplice in the violence. The couple's first victim was a nine-year-old girl, named Vernita Wheat, whose mother Alton had become friends with before. They kidnapped her from Wisconsin on the 29th of May, 1984, and her decomposed remains were found in an abandoned building almost a month later. She had been sexually assaulted before she was strangled to death. Shortly before Vernita's body was found, Alton and Deborah abducted two more children in Indiana, Annie Turks, who was nine, and Tamika Turks, who was seven. Both girls were sexually assaulted. Tamika died during the attack, but Annie managed to survive. That same day, Alton and Deborah kidnapped 25-year-old Donna Williams. Just like Vernita Wheat, Donna was assaulted and strangled to death, and then her body was dumped. After attacking Annie and Tamika and murdering Donna, Alton decided that he needed a different vehicle to avoid being recognized. In Michigan, he and Deborah broke into a house and attacked the owners, Mr. and Mrs. Palmer Jones. After beating the couple and then destroying their phone to delay them and calling for help, Alton and Deborah stole the car and drove off to Ohio. During their short time staying in Toledo, Ohio, Alton made friends with a single mother, Virginia Temple. After a few days, Virginia's loved ones became concerned when she ceased all communication and arranged for a welfare check. When authorities arrived at Virginia's house, they initially saw no signs of her or her oldest daughter, nine-year-old Rochelle. But all of the younger children were still in the house, uncared for and appearing traumatized. A search of the home revealed that both Virginia and Rochelle had been strangled and their bodies hidden inside a small crawl space under the house. Straight after killing Virginia and Rochelle, Alton and Deborah changed their car again. Once again, they broke into a random house and robbed the owners, taking cash and their car, before eventually making their way to Cincinnati. Three days after their arrival in Cincinnati, 15-year-old Tony Story vanished. The following week, her body was found, and it was lying on top of a bracelet that belonged to Virginia Temple. Alton and Deborah weren't covering their tracks as well as they believed they were. The string of interstate murders had begun shortly after Alton went on the run, and authorities were able to link several of the crimes together. On the same day that Tony was kidnapped, the FBI made an announcement. 
they had added an 11th name to their 10 most wanted list, including Alton Coleman as a special edition. On the 13th of July, Alton and Deborah decided to briefly change their mode of transport, using bicycles to travel to Norwood, Ohio. They quickly attacked a couple, Marlene and Harry Walters, sexually assaulting and fatally beating Marlene, beating Harry to the point of unconsciousness, and then stealing the couple's car. Alton's fingerprints had been left at the crime scene on a shattered glass bottle, and both Alton and Deborah had left their footprints behind in blood. Moving through Kentucky, Alton and Deborah kidnapped a college professor, Oline Carmichael Jr. They stole Oline's car, but they kept the professor locked inside the trunk while they did it, keeping him inside throughout their drive back to Ohio. Once they got back, they ditched the car with him still in the trunk. Authorities located the abandoned car, and he was rescued and unharmed. Alton and Deborah then stole another car and drove off to Illinois, trading their vehicle on the way after they killed an elderly man and took his car. Three days after this final murder, Alton and Deborah were recognized by a motorist who called the police, and they were arrested. They were carrying an enormous bag full of different shirts and caps, which they had been using to change their appearance several times throughout the day, hoping that it would prevent them from being noticed. When Alton was being strip-searched at the police station, officers discovered that he was wearing two thick pairs of socks and had hidden a steak knife in between them. The following week, a group of more than 50 different investigators and law enforcement officers from throughout the United States met up, trying to plan the most successful strategy for prosecuting Alton and Deborah. The group agreed on seeking the death penalty and decided that the best way to achieve this result was to prosecute the duo in Ohio first. U.S. Attorney Dan Webb summarized the decision, saying, quote, We are convinced that prosecution in Ohio can most quickly and most likely result in the swiftest imposition of the death penalty against Alton Coleman and Deborah Brown. Sure enough, the couple were convicted in Ohio, found guilty of assaulting and murdering Tony Story and Marlene Walters, and sentenced to death. Another 20-year sentence was added on for kidnapping because Alton and Deborah locked Olin Carmichael in the trunk of his own car and then had driven him across state lines. Alton repeatedly claimed that his sentence was unconstitutional, but every time the case was sent before the Supreme Court, the sentence was upheld. When the time for Alton's execution came along, the Ohio Supreme Court was aware that many people who had survived Alton and Deborah's crimes wanted to be there to witness his death. Alton's lawyers claimed that allowing so many people to be present would turn his death sentence into a spectator sport. But instead of reducing the number of witnesses to the execution, the court created a separate viewing venue to accommodate them all. Shortly before his death, Alton wrote a letter in which he apologized for the crimes he committed. He had a lavish last meal, which included filet mignon, fried chicken, french fries, onion rings, salad, and cornbread, and a cherry Coke to drink. He was executed via lethal injection on the 26th of April, 2002. At the time he died, he was the only person in the U.S. to be sentenced to death in three different states, Ohio, Illinois, and Indiana. While Alton's attempts to fight against his death sentence were unsuccessful, Deborah was luckier. Governor Richard Celeste agreed to sentence Deborah to life imprisonment instead, stating that he was doing so because Deborah had been in a master-slave relationship where she would do anything that Alton asked, and because she had consistently low IQ scores showing a lack of critical thinking and understanding of the consequences of her actions. Although Deborah had no history of criminal activity before going on the run with Alton, she didn't show any remorse for her crimes during the early days of her imprisonment. In fact, while being sentenced during one of her trials, she wrote a note for the judge, which said, quote, I killed the bee, and I don't give a damn. I had fun out of it. That's 10 Minute Murder for today. Brief and bingeable true crime. I'm Joe, I'm the host, and I appreciate you listening. 
If you're new, subscribe to 10 Minute Murder, and that way you'll more easily catch up on all the back episodes. Never miss any of the new ones. Connect on social media, see the pictures, what we talk about. It's never gross and graphic stuff, though. And speaking of social media, I guess TikTok, that's considered social media. I don't know. But I posted a TikTok um, some time ago talking about how wife and baby killer Scott Peterson has now a ponytail in jail. That video seemed to get a little bit of tension. And in the comments, in you, rule number one, if you're a content creator, you don't read the comments. And I usually try not to when it gets crazy, uh, but I couldn't help but wade into some of the things that people were saying in the comments of that TikTok video. Way more people than I thought believe that Scott Peterson is innocent. That has nothing to do with his ponytail, which looks ridiculous, but I was kind of shocked. I knew that there was a certain group of people out there that thought Scott Peterson could be innocent, probably might be innocent, because they watched the documentary that his side put out. I get that. I mean, it's, it was a pretty persuasive documentary if you ignore the fact that his side put it out and it's not completely vetted. However, I don't know, like I said in the video, I don't know if he's guilty or innocent. I do believe that he is guilty. He was convicted by a jury of his peers with the evidence presented in court. I do believe he's guilty. However, wow, there's a lot of people that believe he's innocent. Anyway, I have a 10-minute murder TikTok account. In case you were wondering, you can go and, and, and follow it there. Thank you for listening to another 10-minute murder podcast episode. I will see you on the next one. Bye.